every day, you see the signs happening all across the world. Jesus said, when we see these things, we can know the end is near. Through the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, discover the truth about what your future holds. Join speaker Linwood Spangler as he uncovers the truth with PowerPoints of Prophecy. Tonight's message is entitled, The Impossible Deliverance. What's it called? The Impossible Deliverance. It was a hot summer day in Scotland. Peter had decided to take a shortcut home. After he was visiting some of his friends, the night was dark, but he cut his way through the hither of the night. He was taking that familiar path of which he had traveled many times in the past. But that evening, as he rounded the curve, he became disoriented and got off the path of which he was so familiar with because the darkness was so thick that night. It seemed to engulf him. So he began to feel his way with his feet because he knew he, he had to make a sharp turn here somewhere, but he couldn't remember where. And all of a sudden, the weeds started getting thicker, and he thought, well, I'm not sure which way to turn. And just as the weeds cleared out, he, he made one more step. And when he did, someone hollered, Peter, Peter. And he thought, I'm crazy. I'm clear out here in the no man's land. There's no houses around. Who would be hollering for me after all? It's so dark, I can't even see the path. So he went to take another step. And when he did, this, loud, this voice got louder, Peter, Peter. And it was so loud this time, it startled him, and he fell down on his feet, and when he did, on his knees. And when he did, he went forward. His one hand hit the dirt, and the other hand hit absolutely nothing. And then he realized where he was. Because, you see, the path that he took home so many times did not have a fence beside of it, but it did have a precipice of a hundred-foot drop-off into a quarry. And he realized then where he was, and with tears of joy, he knew it was his heavenly Father in heaven that had called his name that night to keep him from falling over the edge. He knew he was called by God. Peter Marshall tells a true story because he went on to be a chaplain on the U.S. Senate floor. He had sensed that God had tapped him on the shoulder. He had sensed that God had called his name. Does God know your name tonight? He certainly does. Take your Bible and turn with me to chapter 4 of Daniel as we continue this journey. For what time period? For what time period? The time of the end. Not the end of time, the time of the end. We'll be getting to the end of time prophecies as we continue. But remember, the book of Daniel was written for our time. So we want to go to Daniel chapter 4. We've been studying the journey of Daniel and why he, God preserved it for our time. Tonight we're going to discover a man that was called by God. By the way, in previous evenings I ask you to do your homework and no one, not a single person came to me and told me what chapter was not written by Daniel. Ah, oh, back in the back I hear a voice. Chapter number 4. Daniel didn't write it. Who did? Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4 verse 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, languages that dwell on the earth. Now watch what he says. Read it with me aloud. Peace be multiplied unto you. This is a heathen king, a bloodthirsty king, a man of war, a man that has conquered the entire world at his command, even went into Judah, God's land, and conquered God's kingdom. Or did he? God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to have domain to reveal something to us tonight. This is the same king that erected the Daniel 3 image who had demanded worship on last night's topic. He continues in verse 2, but now he's speaking peace. He says, I thought it good to show the signs 
and the wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. Again, those signs and wonders, friends, are like those signposts. He says, I've got to stop right now in my life before I breathe my last breath and tell you what God has done for me. Nebuchadnezzar had gone through a conversion experience. Do you want to know what you look like when you go through a conversion experience? Look at the story of Nebuchadnezzar tonight. It is life transforming. And so we continue. This is Nebuchadnezzar's conversion story, the story of a heathen king transformed by a mighty God. He says, I've got to speak. I've got to tell you what God has done to change my life. He radically did something in my heart. He's glowing with God's grace. God knew Nebuchadnezzar by name. He tapped him on the shoulder. Listen, friends, what's the message for us tonight in Daniel chapter 4? If God can take a godless king, a heathen king, a wicked king, an adulterous king, and place peace, place what? Peace in his heart. There's hope for you and me. Regardless what condition we are in tonight, no matter how much we have disobeyed God and turned our back on Him, there is hope for you. No matter how much guilt you have in your life because of some sin that you have committed in the past, if God can take a wicked king like Nebuchadnezzar and transform him, the message is tonight, He can call you by name. Anyone on planet earth that still has breath in their lungs, God can call them by name. Verse 3, how great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar says, I must tell you my story, how God changed me, how the human heart, each human heart is a unique story. From the alcoholic to the drug addict, God can change their life. To the youth that has been brought up in a Christian home but rebelled, God can change their life. To the church grower that has gone all throughout their life out of tradition or out of habit, and then they have that encounter with God like they've never expected, God can change our lives. Every story will be different. It's going to be the highlight of heaven, friends. This is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony of a heathen king. Verse 4, he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, watch carefully. The simple first grade English words are the most remarkable. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. He had no thought for God. Everything was going well. Servants were catering to his every whim. If he said, I want mango tonight, they brought in the best mango. That's my favorite fruit, by the way. <laughs> went to Philippines just last year. And when I went to leave, they were asking me, what do you like about the Philippines? I said, oh, your mangoes are heavenly. You like mangoes? Oh, what the, well, yes. What kind of mangoes do you like? I said, well, whatever kind is, is ripe. I said, especially when I get back to the States, I love those dried mangoes. They are so sweet. When I went to leave, they handed me a bag of 30 pounds of dried mangoes. <laughs> oh, they are so good. My mouth is watering right now. I'm just thinking about them. Whatever the king wanted, he had someone there serving his every desire. He had the whole orchestra outside of his, his tent that he slept in in his palace. Everything was there for him. Nighttime when he got ready to pull away from his duties of the day was his feast time. Anything he wanted, it was on tap for his desire. So he says he was at rest in his palace. He had everything a man or woman could ever want. He was the wealthiest man on earth. And yet, he didn't have everything. That's his testimony tonight. 
Jesus says, make sure you record Nebuchadnezzar's personal testimony. Where will your story be in the courts of heaven? Your story will be just as valuable as Nebuchadnezzar's story. Jesus is telling us tonight that this story is so powerful. Why? Because he had everything. Have you ever said, if I just could win the lottery, my life would be different. I could serve the Lord full time then. I'd give so much money to churches. Oh, yeah? How dare we think we have more power to make the right choice than the multitudes of people that became a millionaire because of the lottery and lost everything, including priceless relationships of which God had built all their life. What is it we desire? That will be our temptation. Nebuchadnezzar had everything. God says in 2008, if, you just, if, you, if you're tempted to believe that if you had a better job, a more money, a better mate in life, better kids, you could be recognized for who you are. How dare you believe that? Because God says, don't do it. Don't fall into that pitfall. God has given you what he sees we can handle. We don't have more because he doesn't want us to lose what we have. He says, in 2008, I have given you exactly what you need to be perfectly ready for the next step in Jesus Christ. God knows us better than we know ourselves. He's created us from the beginning of time. But then one day, Nebuchadnezzar had it all, but then it all changed. It's amazing, isn't it? One night in his bedroom, he had another one of those pizza dreams? No. It was a God-given dream. And his dream troubled him. But yes, friends, isn't it incredible how everything can be going smooth? I don't know about you, but when you get past the 45-year-old mark, you start seeing some things that repeat and enlarge as you get older. Am I alone out here tonight? I hope not. But when things start really going smooth and you feel good inside, I don't know whether you feel this way, but you're almost tempted to believe, oh, what's coming up next? (laughs) Things are going too smooth here lately. And then four or five appliances break down like that. All at once. And you're scurrying around to take care of what's needed to be done. Or maybe everything's going fine, you just had a family reunion, it was such a wonderful thing, and then a telephone call comes in the middle of the night. A telephone call of which you will never forget. I remember a time like that. I was 17 years old. Quit school in my 12th year because they wanted me to go a 13th year because I just didn't apply myself. I was fed up with school. My father and mother here tonight, they'll remember this morning. I was going off to work construction. I had just quit school not too many weeks before. But I was 17 looking for 18. Why? Because my older brother, the number one child of eight children, told me, Lynn, as soon as you turn 18, you're going to go with me and we're going to drive long distance truck. He has been a long distance truck driver for many, many years at that time. And he said, as soon as you turn 18, we're going to be a team together. And I longed to do it because we had been primarily in the Maryland area all of our lives. And so I quit school, and I was only a couple weeks, maybe a month out of school, and I was in my sister's house early that morning, and the phone call came. My brother had been killed in a car accident that morning going to pick up his truck. For 10 years, I couldn't even be in the same room of my family talking about my brother. I would get that lump in my throat. Why? Because I had lost my dream. My dream was to drive and to see the country. It's amazing how all can go well and then all of a sudden, one moment changes everything. Think about the families, the parents of the 900 children that were killed today in the school when it collapsed on them in China from the earthquake. 900 parents lost their children just like that. 
Nebuchadnezzar was in his palace, flourishing. He had everything. Nothing could go wrong for him, or could it? Oh, yes. Maybe again, you're looking forward to that retirement. You go for your normal checkup, and the doctor says you have six months to live. There are times. When God brings us to the crossroads of our life to teach us that He has our future. Regardless what kind of education we have, regardless what kind of collateral or, or, or cash we have in the bank, God says, I've got to bring you to the place. That you totally trust in God. So that when the trumpet sounds, we'll keep our eyes on Jesus instead of the earth that is quaking around us. Nebuchadnezzar was flourishing in his palace, but he was separated. He was what? Separated from God. Then one night, God brought him into the knowledge again. Verse 5, I saw a dream which made me what? Afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I made a decree. Here we go again. To bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation. Come on, Nebuchadnezzar, Chaldeans, astrologers. Before we criticize Nebuchadnezzar, how many times have we had the same lesson come through our life and didn't learn it the first time? If they couldn't help in chapter 2, how can they help in chapter 4? But this time he doesn't spend a lot of time on them. Verse 8, it says, but at last who? Put your name in there. But at last God will call you into picture. But Lynn, I'm, I'm a nobody you are the sons and daughters of a living God who has been created for a certain purpose. Do you sometimes have the Nebuchadnezzar syndrome? Something breaks, you get all distressed. I've got to get there on time. You run here and there with anxiety. You do everything you can to solve it. Then you say, you know what? <laughs> Forgive me, God. Can you help me? We all have that syndrome. We should have called God first to learn that there is a God in heaven that longs to solve our problems is the lesson God wants us to go through. Verse 10, there were, thus were the visions of my head in my bed. I saw and behold in the midst of the earth, the height thereof was great. I saw a tree like never before, he says. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, the sight thereof unto the end of all the earth, and the leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit were much, and, and in it was meat for all. And the beast of the field had shadow unto it, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof, and all the flesh was fed of it. Repeating and enlarged, this tree was the life source in this dream. And I saw a watcher, sorry, I saw in the vision of my head upon the bed, and behold, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. Verse 14, he cried aloud and said, hew down the tree, cut off its branches, shake off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beast get away from under, what? It, notice, it. He starts out not calling it a him or her. It's an it. Now watch, there's a transition going to take place. And the fowls from under his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of what? 
his roots in the earth. Even with the band of iron and the tender grass, the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the grass, the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed, verse 16, from a man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him, and let seven, how many? Seven what? Times. Underline that. Remember that. I'm going to come back to you on the night when we talk about the Antichrist, and this word times is going to come alive for you. God intentionally lays down the chapter 1 of Daniel. Daniel is again turning victory, defeat into victory by the power of God because he is obedient. Who is Jesus reaching? He's reaching those who get hit with the unexpected. God is telling us he can turn defeat into victory. Amen? And so because of that, he is the God to be praised. He takes our shattered lives and turns them into victorious embers that will be the trophies throughout the universes as to how God can transform a human life. We saw a God who reveals who really truly knows the future as we went on in Daniel chapter 2 and saw that he reveals his knowledge to the prophet. Who's he reaching in today's environment? Jesus is reaching the ones who feel they've been seemingly forgotten. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They've been forgotten or have they? No. And God realizes they want to be used by God. They had been in leadership position which was great in Babylon. But they really had not done anything memorable for God. God is speaking to us tonight. You feel like you've been faithful all of your life. You've gone to church as often as possible. You've always given your tithes and offerings to the Lord and yet really haven't been able to do anything magnificent for God. Hang on, friends. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah is God's message to us tonight in Daniel chapter 2. I haven't forgotten you. You live in the place I need you to live. You live in the time period of what needs you most. And then chapter 3, Jesus reveals himself as the true Savior or priest, one who represents his people. Who is he reaching? God, Jesus is reaching the ones who feel helpless but are certain they are doing right. Over and over, God is reaching us tonight with his message. And now in Daniel chapter 4, Jesus is going to reveal himself as the true king. And you'll see that message is given through Daniel. Why? Because Daniel is getting the message for us tonight that Jesus is reaching those who are, watch carefully, afraid of offending others by doing what? Stating the truth. I don't know about you, but I pray more today than ever before, God, give me the wisdom to say your words and not mine. Because we are in such a sensitive time. People are wearing their feelings and emotions on their shirt sleeves, so to speak. If you say something different than their church teaches, boom, they're gone. Why? Because they've grown up in a church instead of Jesus Christ. When Jesus lives in your heart, when Jesus teaches you through Bible study, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you understand the word, you walk upon the truth of Jesus by the word of God, then you can go any church, any place, and know the difference between truth and counterfeit. Why? Because it's based upon the word. Don't be afraid of offending others when you're sharing God's love for you and the truth that he has given you. Daniel even struggled with this, as we'll discover tonight. Finally, Daniel's called in. And so this great tree dream came before Daniel. And he knew what was going to happen because he knew the interpretation this time. Verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour. His thoughts troubled him. Now, now. How many can remember your first date? Nobody in here. You must be all older than I am. Come on, put your hands up. How many can remember the first time you dated? Were you nervous of not having the right things to say? One was, but he went, whoo! 
I was, I would get knots in my stomach just thinking about it. I, I, well, it's a long story. I won't go into it all. But I met my wife, which was my first date that I remember, conveniently. <laughs> but it, it was. It was my first date that I remember. And I remember having that 69 Buick Special. And I had my brother-in-law paint on the dash, Lynn loves Peggy, on the hard dash in paint. If you go out to my Volkswagen Jetta, you see it embroidered in the carpet in the dash. So anyway, I remember that first date. I asked Peggy if I could come and see her that night and have a date with her. And she said, well, I'm babysitting tonight. It's really not. I said, well, I'll come. I, I don't care. And I've been raised in a Christian home, and I went down to visit my wife Peggy, and she lived in a town called Jugtown. It was a place where they used to make moonshine in Maryland. And so I, I drove down there, and here it was. You know, she was up on a little hillside in a, in, a, in a trailer, mobile home. And so I knocked on the door, and she, I went on in, and the kids were all in there. They were a friendly bunch of kids, and they were watching roller derby. None of you remember that, I'm sure, but you do? Okay. They were watching roller derby, and I'm, I'm looking at it. I couldn't believe my eyes. Girls taking chairs and banging each other over the head. I'm going, whoa, man, they're violent. I had never seen that on television before, and the kids were going, yeah, get her, get her. I'm going, no wonder my wife didn't want me to come and baby, watch her, uh, be with her when she was babysitting this bunch of kids. They're, they're rough. Well, after, I mean, it wasn't hard to find things to say then. I was just watching. You know, I, I was spellbound. There was so much noise in the house. I didn't have to hold a conversation. Well, finally, the kids got to around 9 o'clock, 9.30, whenever it was, 10 o'clock, and it was time for them to go to bed. And then it was just Peggy and I, and I, I knew I had to leave and get home one time. I had things the following day. And so we went out and sat in the car, and I, I was trying to think of things to say, and I, I was nervous. You know, she was talking. I was listening to what she was saying. I was trying to get everything she was talking about and try to respond properly. At the same time, I'm thinking, what if I run out of thoughts? <laughs> and she might not like me. I was very insecure in this dating world. Daniel is before the superpower leader of the world, who was his friend. And he sat there in silence for one hour after the king told him what he needed. One hour. Now imagine, the king didn't hear cell phones ringing. <laughs> the back part know what I'm talking about. The king didn't hear anything, but maybe a little Babylonian noise around the courts. But listen, friends, the king sat there patiently. Come on. Daniel, uh, I didn't have a watch, but for one hour he sat there in silence in the king's presence. This was heavy on Daniel. Daniel knew that what he was about to tell the king was going to transform his life. Have you ever been in that situation? Been in the presence of your friends and you knew you were about to share something with them that was going to change their life? And you didn't want to tell them? You may even have said, God, please give me wisdom to be able to share with this person. Friends, I know that we are in a group of people here tonight that there are over 20 churches represented in this group of people. In fact, there are more guests here tonight than there are members from this church because various reasons. And I can promise you, in this seminar, you're going to learn things in the Bible and the, and the Lord's going to deliver you the mail. And that mail is going to be contrary to what you ever heard in the Bible before, but yet it's going to come right from the Word. And friends, only by holy boldness can we look at the message of God and read it with transparency. Jesus wants His people to know the truth in the last days. Are you with me? And we should not be ashamed of the gospel, but at the same time, if we have the love of God in us, we hurt for the people that have not heard the truth to this point. And we long for their hearts to accept the truth because it's the difference in day and night. It's the difference of walking with Jesus or walking near Jesus. Tonight, God is telling us that Daniel struggled with his friend Nebuchadnezzar because he loved him so much that he knew the message that he was about to give him was a life or death matter. 
He knew Nebuchadnezzar had an encounter with God before, but he had turned his back on the situation. He knew that that Nebuchadnezzar understood the Daniel 2 image and where it came from. He actually put a command out in regard to God. But now Daniel knows his friend well, and he knows his friend has gotten off the path. Did Daniel shake a finger at him? No, he was still his friend. Are you hearing me tonight? And so Daniel sat there for one hour in the presence of a king until finally the king had to break the silence. The king spake and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Come on, Daniel, relax. Don't let my problem be your problem. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee. In other words, it's going to benefit your enemies. The interpretation thereof to thine enemies. Now friends, notice, Daniel did not say, Now, O king, you're going to get yours. Daniel didn't say, You ripped me out of my homeland as a child. You took me away from my friends. You killed my relatives. You killed all those people in the past, all in the name of Babylon. Now, O mighty king, you can do what you want with me, but you're going to get yours. That wasn't Daniel's attitude. Daniel knew, friends, this great Bible principle. Let's say it together. You will never influence your friends or your enemies unless you love them and that is not a requirement oh I have gotta love my enemies to get to heaven that is a result of what Christ does in your heart when Jesus is allowed to live in you through the Holy Spirit when your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit you will love even your enemies Because Revelation describes his saints in the last days as those who sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. The song of Moses, Moses said on top of the mountain after the people worship the golden calf, Father, take my name out of the book of life, but give those people another chance. The ones that had actually destroyed what God told them to keep holy. The Lamb, Jesus, hung on the cross and said, Father... Forgive them, for they know not what they do. The song of Moses and the Lamb will be the song of the last day people. Why? Because Jesus was so allowed to to live in their life that their lives reflected the thoughts of Jesus. Daniel's life is an example of what you are or will become before Jesus comes. These are not just children's stories. These are the stories of God's redeemed. These are the stories that help us to realize the love of God and what effect it will take on our lives when it fully inhabits every cell of our body. I don't know about you, but I'm not there yet. I still drive in the heavy traffic of Dallas and somebody wants to play speed demon and go around you and the six inches between bumpers. I go, what did you do that for? Okay, God forgive me. Hello. Lord, please finish what you've started in me. Let's do it another way besides this traffic deal. Jesus isn't finished yet. Daniel knew that in his friend's life, Nebuchadnezzar, major changes were about to take place. Daniel remembered the moments when he was ripped out of his environment. Daniel remembered those moments like he will never forget. You talk about trauma to the mind, being castrated in a foreign land that have all kind of gods and then told you have to eat their food. His whole life was transformed, but he still learned to love his enemies. God wants his people To understand the magnitude of God's love. The beauty of God is that He he never treats us like we deserve. He treats us like He wants us to what? Treat others. You will never influence your co-worker 
that has intentionally robbed you of opportunities. You will never influence their life if you don't love them. Verse 20. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, which heist reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair. Now Daniel's repeating after an hour. He's repeating what Nebuchadnezzar has told him. To walk him through it very carefully. And in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field dwell, and upon whose branches the fowls of heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king. Thou art grown and become strong. Thy greatness is grown and reached unto heaven. Thy dominion to the end of the earth. Verse 23. And whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one come down from heaven and say, Hew down the tree, destroy it, yet leave the stump of its roots thereof in the earth. Daniel was silent. And then when Daniel says, I've got to do God's work, he's not shy. He repeats every detail to remind Nebuchadnezzar of the importance of this dream. Friends, you may be holding back in sharing what you're learning with others. But when you do share, don't leave out anything. Are you with me? Unfortunately, what the devil will do for some he will allow us to come night by night to a seminar like this until we get to a wow topic. And they're coming, believe me, you will go wow before this seminar is one-third finished. You will just want to get home and, and on the way home you'll be calling your friends in your, other, in your church and you'll be calling them and saying, guess what I learned tonight? And then you'll back the dump truck of truth up on them and go boom. And they're going, where are you going? That, you, you've lost your mind. And you go, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have told them that. Share with them the truth as you are learning it. Do not wait until you get to one of these topics that you can't hold anymore. You're like a pressure cooker. You just want to explode and share it with all your friends at church. And then they think you're nuts. They think you've lost your sanity because it seems so ridiculous to them. However, it is the chain of truth that God is leading us through. Daniel knew once he had that power from God, once he had spent an hour with Nebuchadnezzar in silence, he says, I've got to do what God has called me to do, whether it means my life or not. King, that tree, that's you. You are going to be cut down. Right there, Nebuchadnezzar could have lost it and says, take his head off. Nobody talks to me that way. Friend or enemy. I am the great mighty leader. That's the king Nebuchadnezzar before this event. Daniel knew that he could not set and be shy the rest of his life. He had a purpose in life. What he was about to do was going to be penned down in the scriptures and reverberate throughout all mankind from Daniel's time until the trumpet sounds because of Daniel's faithfulness to God. And what you do today, what thoughts you are thinking right now, we're going to discover in a coming night. Ezekiel says there's an angel with you recording every thought and feeling with the pen that cannot lie. And those are recorded in the books of heaven. And what you think tonight will reverberate throughout the endless ages of earth's history as to how God transformed your thoughts and feelings. Your life is just as valuable as Daniel's. Why would Jesus give us this story? If your life wasn't valuable in the eyes of the Creator God, the angels are longing to see these transformations take place in humanity. It goes on, verse 24. This is the interpretation, O King, and this is the decree of the Most High which has come upon my Lord, the King. Here we go that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as the oxen. King, you're going to be like an animal. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, 
and seven times. He knew what times were. Seven times shall pass over thee till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whosoever he will. The tree truly was a representation of what Daniel wanted him to see tonight. Over and over, Daniel is repeating himself here. Verse 26. And whereas they command to leave the stump of the tree and the roots... Thy kingdom shall be sure, king, but you're going to have to go out and you're going to have to wander for seven times in the, in the fields with the animals, but your kingdom's going to be solid. After that, thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. So the dream of all of this was to let Nebuchadnezzar, who ultimately was in control, let him know who was in control of his life as well. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king, can't you hear the Daniel's sympathetic voice? O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness. Jesus is speaking to us tonight, friend. And thine iniquities by showing what? Mercy the poor king you have so much. Bless the poor. See, Lynn, it's not speaking to me because you don't realize I've got so many debts. Friends, the poorest man in this congregation is rich in Africa. You go with me to Africa and you see the ministers that have been ministering and giving their all for 30 years who have 40 and 50 churches and their elbows are out of their suits. They save their shoes for that special day when they go and be with the congregation and their shoes are so worn out their toes are sticking through. When you see the godly men that have dedicated their lives and yet have nothing. When they have all these churches, they don't even have time to spend time with their family. They're going from one church to the next, making sure that they're getting the gospel. You're very wealthy in their eyes. And so Daniel says, King, please show mercy to the poor. You want to make wrongs right? Show mercy to the poor. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. There are some times when God taps us on the shoulder. He taps once, he taps twice. And we walk away from him. We go on living godless lives, occupied with things of time rather than things of eternity. As we walk away from him, we feel the tap on our shoulder. Then a minor crisis comes. God does not cause it, but he doesn't keep it from happening because he knows it can draw us to him. But if we continue in the course of neglect or rejection and careless compromise, God allows the volume of his voice to be turned up. So that that which we did not accept in a time of joy, we will learn in a time of sorrow. God loves us so much that he wants us to learn the lessons to get ready for heaven. God had a plan from your life from the time that you were born a little baby. His plan for your life was joy and happiness and we got off track somehow. He taps us on the shoulder. God loves us so much that he would rather have you go through some disappointments here on planet earth than for you to lose your eternal life. God looked down at Nebuchadnezzar. He was telling him, I don't want you to lose your throne. I put you in that position. But if you don't repent... The only way I can reach you is allow circumstances to happen, to occur, in which you will lose your throne. Now notice, even after the dream, God gives him time. Verse 28. All this came unto the king Nebuchadnezzar, and at the end of what? Twelve months. He walked in the palace in the kingdom of Babylon, and the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that God has built? Oh. 
Is not this house that I live in because of my great job? Is not this car I drive a result of my education? Is not the family of friends I have because of my great sense of humor? At the end of the 12 months, he's standing there and he says, look at what I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. Can't you hear Nebuchadnezzar? Verse 31, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice. Friends, when you hear people boasting, I don't know about you, but it makes me want to get away from them. Because God's going to humble them one way or the other. He has to bring them to their knees. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. Babylon was a mighty kingdom. It's still called one of the many wonders of the world. The hanging gardens were beautiful. The fragrance of Babylon. We're not talking about generic flowers. We're not talking about hybrids. We're talking about fragrances that we can't even imagine. Was there all around the king's quarters. Can you imagine waking up in the fragrance of a beautiful rose? I mean, honeysuckles. One thing we haven't touched yet. You go out in, in the country east of here. My last seminar was in Tyler. And as I go out and visit the folk that attended the meetings, I'd pull in their driveway and you put the windows down and go, oh, you smell it. And I would get out of my car and go over and see the honeysuckles, pull a flower bit, bud off and pull the stem out and then just, you only get one drop. Oh, but it's sweet. There I go salivating again. And so friends, can you imagine Babylon? I mean, the gardens were everywhere. Anything the king wanted was he walked from one room to another in the palaces. He could smell the fragrances of heaven, but he never allowed his thoughts to go to heaven. How close do we get today to Christ? And yet we really don't know him. And so he's right there, and he's boasting about his place, the beauty of his place, and the same, while the words were still in his mouth, the kingdom is departed there from him. Friends, one year later, after the dream, isn't that parallel to our lives tonight? God gave us a chance to change in how we plunged on the same old way. Friends, don't take this seminar lightly. It's not about a denomination. It's not about Lynn Spangler. It's about God calling Fort Worth one more time. One more time. I'm not a doomsday howler, but the mail God has given me says, this world's about to rock and roll, and I'm not talking about a concert. This world is coming to the end as we know it. Jesus, our creator God that speaks worlds into existence, is finally going to stop hiding himself from humanity. And the great and climactic moments of earth's history that all the prophets of the past are going to come, play, come to place before our eyes very quickly. God's people who are secure in Christ Jesus, they will be shouting for joy, Jesus is coming. But those who have postponed the moments of transfer from the world to heaven, their hearts will fail them for fear. The Bible says there'll be a starvation for the word. They'll be running from one continent to the next, looking for someone to give them what, the, what they once heard. Thinking that it was man that gave it to them, and now they long to have it again, but it's too late. It's like Nebuchadnezzar, one year after his dream, and he's still boasting. Because he got his eyes caught up in the created instead of the creator. Nebuchadnezzar almost forgot the dream. Old Babylon, it's about 100 miles south of Baghdad, 
Precision Way leads down into the old city and every brick had his name on it. In the height of his arrogance, God says, in the height of the arrogance of humanity, in the height when we think we can take care of all of our problems, just print more money, God says, I'm going to take it out away from you. Verse 32, they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling place shall be with the beasts of the fields. Verse 23, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and did eat the grass as an oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs was grown like eagle feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. Nebuchadnezzar, I can almost smell him. Seven years without a shower. Seven years without a haircut. Seven years without nail clippers. This is Middle Eastern culture, friends. Over there they have thick beards. Seven years without shaving. Let me set up a scenario tonight. All of Nebuchadnezzar's peers knew what was happening with Nebuchadnezzar after seven years in the wilderness. They knew that his life was a wreck. So imagine sitting in a club of Babylon and somebody coming from the remote areas coming into Babylon to see what's happening these days. And they come in there and he sits down at a club with one of the other rulers and he says, how's it going in Babylon these days? Well, it's been different. What do you mean? Well, with Nebuchadnezzar gone, everything's sort of different, you know, that has different rulership, and we're all wondering what's going to happen to Babylon, and the guy looks over and says, what do you mean, Nebuchadnezzar? Where have you been all your life? I mean, what do you mean? Don't you even know that Nebuchadnezzar's been out of it for a while? The guy looks at him, he says, what do you mean, out of it? You haven't seen, you haven't heard about Nebuchadnezzar? No, man, we don't even get sunlight half the time over there. Come with me tomorrow morning. What do you mean? Come with me tomorrow morning. So the next morning, they both get up early, and they ride in the chariot. He says, where are you taking me? So I want you to see Nebuchadnezzar. Well, you're going out here in the middle of the field. What are you talking about? They build a new palace out here? No, just look. Shh, be quiet. Here he comes. We're coming up to the hill. They stop the chariot at the bottom of the hill, and the sun's just coming up, and they climb up that hill. And the guy that's thinking he's lost his mind, he, what do you mean dragging me out here in the country? We're crawling on the hill. Shh, be quiet. They get up to the top of the hill, and look, look. He's down in the valley there somewhere. Who is Nebuchadnezzar, I told you. <laughs> there he is. Look, behind that bush. Come on, that's some rodent or something. Bears. I mean, no, look carefully. See the garments? They still have the hem on the bottom. Only Nebuchadnezzar. You're right. Boy, he's so grimy. And what in the world happened to him? That's not Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, it is. He gets up out from under the bush and starts taking his long eagle claws of nails and digging in the dirt under the bushes, looking for worms to eat. You can hardly see his face for the facial hair. Only his eyes are protruding. You can smell him when the wind blows the right direction. Human feces all over his legs and body. How can that happen to Nebuchadnezzar? And the man is awestruck. The whole way back to Babylon, he can't say a word. Because this man knows he didn't have what Nebuchadnezzar has. And if that can happen to the mightiest man in the world, what could happen to him? Friends, Nebuchadnezzar's story is not so unusual tonight. Seven years without mankind. The truth of the matter is, friends, Nebuchadnezzar's story has to have a personal application for us tonight, and it does. Why? Because his story is your story. Nebuchadnezzar sat upon the throne in pride and arrogance. He lost his throne, wandering around in the lost condition. Listen, when Adam and Eve created humanity, they too were given dominion. They too were given robes of righteousness upon which they wore. You also were given that ability. They too have been given the opportunity to walk in Christ Jesus, Adam and Eve, but sin became more attractive than God. Their nature was changed. It became easier to do wrong than right. Their nature became deceitful above all things. 
We can identify with Nebuchadnezzar tonight. Why? Because our natures need changed. Have you ever wondered why it's easier to be angry than it is to be patient? Have you ever wondered why it's easier to be selfish than it is to be kind? Why do we fight the lustful thoughts so much? Our nature needs to be changed. Nebuchadnezzar lost the ability to be the ruler. And he went on to be a demon-like person. His nature was changed. He wandered around like a beast. The scripture says to us tonight, Nebuchadnezzar's telling us this story. The scriptures are telling us that if a defiled individual, if the defiled individual like Nebuchadnezzar can be changed, then so can we. Verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar continues. He says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. Stop there. The insane individual that had no control over himself lifted his eyes unto heaven and miracles began to take place. Are you hearing the message tonight? Regardless what financial condition you are in right now, forget your condition and lift your eyes up into heaven. Regardless what spiritual condition and confusion you are in right now, lift your eyes unto heaven. Regardless what marital condition you are in right now, lift your eyes up into heaven. I don't care what your problem is tonight. The solution is where? In heaven with our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the message for tonight. God keeps repeating himself four different ways, four different facets of God's character. He says, my son Jesus has died on the cross to take care of your problem. Let him do it. Take your eyes off yourself. It's no fun to stare at your navel. Gives you a kink in the neck. And all you see is a hole. For some. It's no fun staring at your own problems of life. You can't see past yourself. But when you turn your eyes on Jesus, it gives us hope. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned to me. You want wisdom? Look to Jesus. And I bless the Most High. And I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Doesn't that give you hope? We're not serving a temporary whim of humanity. Some people think Christianity is just for the weak at heart. Friends, we're not serving a temporary mindset. We're serving an eternal God. One that always has existed and will always exist. We're making the invisible angels of heaven rejoice because of what you are doing tonight. You have chosen God instead of the red button. Hallelujah. You're unusual. You are a minority on planet earth. Even I have a red button on my remote. The Bible says, if any man be in what? Christ. He is a what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Nebuchadnezzar lost the ability to rule. He became like a demon. His nature was changed. He wandered around like a beast. Friends, it's telling us tonight the re results of a changed nature. The scripture says there's hope for every one of us. God says we'd have nothing to fear for the future unless we forget that which we have learned in the past. The human race was created perfect by God. Through sin, our nature was changed. Rebellion entered into the fabric of our being. It seemed that we were propelled to do wrong instead of doing that which was right. 
But Nebuchadnezzar looked to heaven. He knew he could not change himself. Friends, all our own trying will not make us better Christians. All the times you try to be more patient will never make you more patient. All the times you try to be more pure, more generous, more loving, more honest, there's something basically wrong with us inside. It's our nature. But when we look to Jesus and ask Him to give us wisdom, He'll change our nature. Looking out inside, all as I see is my fallen nature. But looking to Jesus, all as I see is his strength. And by beholding, I become what? Changed. My weakness is united to his strength. My frailty is united to his might. And listen carefully. My evil is united to his holiness. Oh, there he goes. He's preaching heresy. Friends, God does not say, be perfect, then you come to me. He says, come as you are, and let him transform you. God is giving us a message tonight. Although I have turned my back on God too many times, God never turned his back on me. Although I slapped him in the face and ignored the cross experience, God says, I'm going to hang on to Lynn because he's going to go through to the end. Tonight, God is calling us to be faithful to Him. Not just because that's what He wants. Because He sees something in you that He knows He will be able to perfect. And when we get to heaven, every individual that will be there will reveal a different facet of Jesus Christ. So finally, when His body is completely together, the universes will sing praises throughout the ages because as they look at you, they see the love of Jesus. Heaven needs your character that has been polished by God because heaven needs to see your expression of Jesus. I want to tell the world about Jesus. I want to tell the universes about Jesus. Don't you, friends, tonight? Tell him by the raise of your hand. Jesus needs you to reflect him. Not just on planet Earth, but throughout the worlds afar off. The universe needs you. You think just your children need you. You think your mother, father needs you. It's much bigger than that, friends. Jesus has created you to reflect his father's love on earth and in heaven. Isn't that incredible? How God can take the wicked to reveal the holy. Jesus is so powerful. And yet, he waits on humanity to reveal his divinity. You are God's holy people. Every one of you in here tonight are holy. Set apart for God's You did not come here to this seminar because the brochure was attractive. It had that ugly looking beast on the front. You didn't come here because you liked the guy on the back, my mug shot, because he, well, I won't talk about him. You came here because Jesus wanted you here tonight. You answered his call. He's calling you home. Let him speak to you throughout eternity. It's no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. That's what he promises. Amen? Amen. Let me close with a song.